Today I'm going to talk about um, neuroimmune aspects of neurodevelopmental disorders with application to autism spectrum disorders. As Amy had um, uh, said, a lot of my interests really are in metabolic um, abnormalities associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, but um, as we've kind of naturally um, uh, researched um, the autism and neurodevelopmental disorders, we found that one of the really key pieces that seems to um, be important um, is neuroimmune um, uh, problems and how they seem to play into um, problems with uh, development. And it seems to be kind of a growing um, area of interest and it's very important as finding treatments. These are my disclosures as far as uh, support for our clinical trials, our research program, and advisory boards. Um, <clears throat> Disclaimer, um, everything that I say here is, is made to be as accurate as possible, although there's no <coughs> implied warranty. And some of the uh, treatments that I talk about today are not FDA approved, so most of them are used off-label. We'll go through our objectives. One, to understand the physiological abnormalities associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, including immune dysfunction. To understand the symptoms associated with antibody-mediated neurodevelopmental disorders, <clears throat> and to understand some of the current treatments for autoantibody-mediated abnormalities associated with neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, several years ago, myself and um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rosignol, um, realized that there was really some growing trends in some kind of novel areas of research that may be telling us um, something about neurodevelopmental disorders and specifically about autism, autism spectrum disorders, um, and that these areas may be very important to point us to treatments. And we wrote this review in Molecular Psych um, and looked specifically at immune dysregulation, inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and environmental toxicant exposure, and compared really the, uh, the amount of research in these new kind of new and novel areas to more traditional areas. <coughs> And it just gives you a, a, a perspective of what has been done in the past and where things are going. And this top line here, this is the years from um, 1971 all, uh, uh, all the way up to 2010. And this is the number of published papers on a log scale. So we go 10, 100, 1,000. What we can see is that this top line here, the area that started very early on and continues to grow and has the most papers, is of course genetics. Um, the other areas that um, really started early on and um, have grown include neuroimaging, neuropathology, and theory of minds. But there's these other areas that are really very important and may tell us something um, not only about the etiologies or the causes of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, but where treatments may be used to actually help children um, with these neurodevelopmental disorders. And these include mitochondrial disorders, immune dysfunction and inflammation, oxidative stress, and a toxicant environmental exposures. And you can see these areas started um, later on instead of in, in the 70s, more in the 80s and almost the 90s, and have started to increase, um, but still remain um, as, uh, as some of the um, less studied areas, but they are growing. If we look at um, the proportion of the total studies that have been published um, versus per year versus the total number of studies, we can see the areas that have um, really gained um, the, the most traction include um, um, immune dysregulation here and uh, investigations of um, toxicant exposure. So in our, um, in our review, we looked at the different abnormalities that have been um, reported in immune dysregulation and, and, and looked at the number of studies. And for the most part, most of the studies that had a lot of papers include cytokine abnormalities, autoantibodies to brain tissue, biomarkers in the CSF of the brain, um, abnormalities in CD4 and CD8 cells, major histocompatibility, uh, complexes, antibodies to foods, and abnormalities in immunoglobulins. And so we'll talk about certain um, of these studies and what they've shown and what their meaning is. One of the first studies that, um, or really first areas of research that 
made us think that there may be some type of immune component related to autism was the studies on um, family history of autoimmune disorders. And there's been um, several studies, and uh, all of them except one um, has been negative. And, and for the most part, um, several studies have shown that family history of rheumatoid arthritis, especially thyroid disorder, um, psoriasis, asthma, um, thyroid disease again, ulcerative colitis, diabetes, type 1, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, appear to be related to um, autism, suggesting that um, there may be something that's inherited um, that uh, may predispose these children to be having some type of um, autoimmune disorder. Um, other studies have looked at the um, haplotypes in the human leukocyte um, antigen, HLA antigen, um, to see if there's any pattern. And um, unfortunately, these studies have been more mixed, with many of them showing um, associations, but many others showing um, no association with any particular HLA. And this is important because HLA, specific patterns of HLA, many times are associated with autoimmune disease. And if we can find a certain pattern, it would tell us um, and confirm that maybe there is some type of autoimmune component. But um, these studies have been um, less um, convince, convincing. So for a long time, although it was thought that there may be um, some type of immune component um, to autism, um, it was, wasn't really clear and there was kind of evidence that was inconsistent. However, I think this paper, a lot of people um, point to this paper in the Annals of Neurology in 2005 that was um, published by the group at Johns Hopkins uh, by Carlos Pardo and Andy Zimmerman that actually looked at the brains of um, 11 uh, children with autism. So they actually um, looked at the brains on autopsy of 11 children with autism and compared them to um, other um, individuals that died of similar age that, uh, that did not have autism. And they also looked at the cerebral spinal fluid of autistic patients uh, to see if there was markers of immune dysfunction or inflammation. One of the uh, first things they did is they looked at the cerebellum and they showed that the cerebellum in the control subject um, was a normal, had all its neurons, which you can see here, the cell bodies, uh, very robust. And then they looked at the autism cerebellum and uh, they showed that there was loss of uh, Purkinje and granular cells um, within cerebellum. And this is a blow up of that photograph here. And what they showed is when they stained for microglial cells that uh, there was activated microglial cells. And microglial cells are, are um, immune cells that have special access to the brain or thought to be kind of the scavengers that, that will clean up any products of inflammation and and any um, degradation products and also are involved in the inflammatory response. Um, so they showed that um, not only was there a loss of neurons, but there was also lots of these microglial um, inflammatory cells. Um, and when they looked at it closely, they, they could um, map out not only that there was these microglial cells um, right next to neurons, but also that they were in proximity to um, astrocytes and that the astrocytes had a special form that looked that were described as reactive astrocytes, which means that they were in a state where they were also um, thought to be in an, in an inflammatory state. So, they, so the astrocytes looked like they were in inflammatory states, and they had these microglial cells, which are um, immune cells in the uh, nervous system, right next to them. So making a, an argument that there, that this, there was this cell loss, and the cell loss may have been, you know, due to actually some type of immune activation. They also looked in the tissue for um, certain cytokines, chemokines, um, and, and other factors, and found that cytokines and other markers of inflammation, um, so um, IL-6, uh, TGF beta-1, uh, IGF um, BP-1, um, and MCP-1, they have diagrammed here as some of the major inflammatory mediators that were elevated. Um, in, in general, <clears throat> they looked at three parts of the brain. They looked at the cerebellum. Um, they looked at the um, 
the cingulate gyrus, and they looked at the frontal gyrus. And they found out there were slightly different patterns, but in general, they found, let's say for the chemokines, that there, there are many elevations in chemokines and uh, cytokines um, and, uh, and other growth factors. To confirm that, um, that this was not just in these uh, samples from autopsy, they also looked at cerebral spinal fluid um, in another set of patients that hadn't passed away. Because, of course, somebody could argue that you, you've gotten brains from individuals that have passed away. Maybe it was because of the cause um, of them passing away that may have uh, made the difference. So here they actually looked at the cerebral spinal fluid, and they looked for elevations in other cytokines and other mediators. And they actually found similar patterns, including M MCP1, IGF, uh, uh, BP1 were two of the ones that were elevated in both um, the brain tissue and the cerebral spinal fluid. But in the cerebral spinal fluid, we can see that there was many elevations in many of the cytokines. <clears throat> they concluded that uh, this really um, showed that it was more of an, a, a, the pattern of the elevations in the cytokines um, indicated that there was an um, increase in the innate immune system um, and concluded that there was evidence that this suggested that there was immune activation in the brain. So that paper, I think, was one of the major papers. And then this was another paper, I think, that made you really say, well, maybe really something is going on with the immune system. Um, and these researchers, this is a, a paper published in Nature, and it was really um, a really nice study and a neat study that they did. They used a model of autism, a, a Rett syndrome mouse. And Rett syndrome, of course, has features of autism. It's a neurodegenerative disease. Um, and what they did to ask the question of whether the immune system was involved in this neurodegenerative disease, they did a bone marrow transplant. So they took um, wild-type mice, that is, unaffected mice, as a, as a sham control and transplanted a wild-type immune system. They took um, the MECP2 mice, the Rett syndrome mice, and looked at them. They took Rett syndrome mice and they transplanted a Rett syndrome immune system. And then they took a Rett syndrome mice and they transplanted a wild-type immune system. So they replaced their immune system. And so if the immune system was involved in neurodegeneration and the development of these characteristics, that uh, is a model of autism and, and other uh, uh, developmental disorders, um, then um, these mice that had this wild-type immune system or this normal immune system when it, was um, when it was transplanted should do well. And that's, that's pretty much what they showed. They showed um, one, um, these Rett syndrome mice have a number of characteristics. They have decreased survival. And so the ones um, that um, the Rett syndrome mice or the ones that were transplanted with a Rett syndrome immune system uh, died early, very early on, whereas the normal mice had a normal lifespan and the uh, Rett syndrome mice that were transplanted with a normal immune system lived a lot longer, this number of days, uh, and proportion survived than, <clears throat> than um, the Rett syndrome um, mice that had a Rett syndrome immune system. Uh, same thing with weight gain. Normal mice had a nice weight gain. Um, Rett syndrome mice um, did not gain weight. And the Rett syndrome mice that were uh, transplanted with a normal immune system um, actually gained weight um, much better than the Rett syndrome mice, and, uh, and, but not as good as the controls, but still made an impressive um, had impressive survival, impressive weight gain. Then they looked at some of the neurologic problems that these mice get. And they showed that the ones in green, the Rett syndrome mice that were transplanted with a normal immune system, um, showed <clears throat> that uh, they did not have the tremor that you see in the Rett syndrome mice. They did not have problems with gait. They, um, uh, they uh, when we look at um, their breathing patterns, which is abnormal in Rett syndrome, that their breathing patterns, number of apneas, was uh, much near normal compared to the Rett syndrome mice. Um, and other um, uh, measures such as breathing irregularity and such were much more normal than were um, the other mice. So this suggested that by taking a normal immune system 
and putting it into the Rett syndrome mice, they made them much better, less symptomatic, and made them live longer, suggesting that the immune system really had a very profound effect on this disease and was involved in this disease. So many people have suggested, well, how does this, how does um, having these different cytokines, um, having um, different types of antibodies really lead to um, having neurodevelopmental disorders because you have this thing called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the bottom line is we, we really don't know, but there's uh, many theories. Some people think that these inflammatory cytokines may not be made in the brain, but they may actually go across the blood-brain barrier and change um, uh, the dynamics of the neurons. Uh, we know that some antibodies can cross um, the, uh, uh, the blood-brain barrier. We know that there are certain states, there are states of immune activation that may make the blood-brain barrier more porous, so antibodies can go across from the blood into the brain and then attack neurons and, and other areas and, and cause problems with neurodevelopmental um, cause neurodevelopmental issues. So um, autoantibodies seem to be a theme that keeps coming up again and again. And there's been many studies um, in children with autism, at least, that have shown that there's antibodies to uh, many different parts of the brain, serotonin receptor, myelin basic protein, um, uh, other uh, heat shock proteins, caudate nucleus, um, uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor and on and on. Um, some of these studies have been um, positive. Most of them have been positive. Some have been negative. Um, and there's been many different antibodies that, uh, uh, that have been found in children with autism to brain tissue. Um, of course, the big question is, what's the meaning of them? You know, do they all disrupt brain development? Um, is it many different antibodies? Is it a few antibodies? These studies just show that these antibodies were present. And I think further studies, more recent studies, have really uh, driven home the fact that these antibodies um, can be disruptive as far as brain development. And I'll show you a few examples. One of the most exciting areas in immunity is um, this, uh, these uh, maternal fetal brain antibodies that have been discovered. So um, this uh, research is out of the Mind Institute at UC Davis. Um, and they did some really um, interesting work where they took blood of mothers that had uh, children with autism. And they looked to see if there was differences in the, uh, the proteins in their blood, and they found the antibodies in, in, in the blood, what they may react to. Um, so they looked at um, maternal antibodies that were in the blood and their reactivity. Um, and they looked at their reactivity to different parts um, of uh, different tissues, one fetal brain, adult brain, uh, duodenum, and kidney. And what they uh, found by just looking at these, um, these assays is uh, that when you look at the, the child that's typically developing, you see that there's some antibodies. But when you look at the uh, children that developed autism, there seemed to be these suspicious bands here to fetal brain that were not present in, in any of the control subjects, suggesting that there was some type of antibodies in the mother's blood um, to fetal brain. Um, they hypothesized that for some reason, um, because of molecular mimicry, um, uh, because of immune imbalances, um, and, and other types of responses, the mother was making some type of antibodies to fetal brain. Um, these uh, antibodies would not affect her brain because she has an intact blood-brain barrier, but um, antibodies do cross the placenta um, into the child, and the blood-brain barrier of the developing child is very porous, so these antibodies can cross um, and cause um, issues with neurodevelopment. So one of the first studies they did um, is they looked at uh, specific um, combinations of these antibodies that they had um, identified, um, and they uh, looked to see if these were just present in children with autism or they were also present in typically developing or developmentally delayed um, children. And what they found in this first study was that in about 12% of children that had autism, um, they found this specific combination 
of um, maternal of antibodies in the maternal blood, but these were present in none of the typically developing children and none of the children with just developmental delays. Um, also, to convince um, themselves that uh, and and everybody else that these actually had some type of meaning and were causing um, autism symptoms, they took serum from um, mothers of children with autism and they injected them into pregnant rhesus monkeys. And then they looked at the offspring. And this is just some of the measures they have. The, the actual movies that they have are very impressive. Um, but um, here we can see stereotypies, which is repetitive behaviors that are characteristics of, of autism, um, that the monkeys that were exposed to um, um, IgG from uh, mothers uh, that had children with autism um, had much higher rates of stereotyped movements um, than um, those born to mothers who were not exposed to um, uh, a maternal serum. Um, in both here solo and unfamiliar pairings, they also did many um, other experiments, including social experiments, where they uh, they approach you know um, familiar and unfamiliar peers, and uh, um, over. Uh, over and over again, they, they show that these monkeys whose mothers were exposed to, um, to uh, IgG of mothers, of human mothers, of children with autism, have, are born and have um, autistic type characteristics. Um, recently, in 2013, they actually identified what some of these antibodies were. They seem to be a wide range of different antibodies, some that interfere with neurotube formation, others that interfere with neurogenesis. Um, dendritic branching, uh, metabolism, um, and axonal growth. Um, another area that we think is really exciting um, uh, because of um, the fact that, uh, that it's a, it seems to be um, uh, linked to a treatment that could be helpful for children with autism <coughs> is the folate receptor alpha autoantibody. It's interesting how folate has to get into your nervous system. Um, you um, think about uh, folate as an important vitamin. Um, you take folate in uh, by vitamins or through food, um, and, uh, and it goes through your blood vessels. But to get into the brain, um, it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. And to do that, um, the most efficient way is to, um, uh, is to bind to this folate receptor alpha and then this folate receptor alpha um, actually, um, through endocytosis, goes in the brain, goes across this coronary plexus cell, and is released into the CSF, so then you have um, folate um, in your brain. It's very important because actually the folate levels in the brain are about five times higher than they are um, in the serum. So you really need an important active transport mechanism to get this folate across so you have high levels in the brain. It ends up about uh, 10 years ago, there was a disorder described um, called cerebral folate deficiency, where it was found that um, children um, with um, certain types of neurodevelopmental, uh, I'm sorry, neuro neurodegenerative type of um, pattern um, seem to have low folate in the nervous system. And then what was identified was um, that uh, this antibody to the folate receptor alpha. Uh, the folate, uh, there was two antibodies that were identified, a blocking and a binding. The blocking antibody prevented folate from actually binding to the folate receptor alpha, whereas the, uh, the uh, binding bound to the folate receptor alpha, uh, making it uh, less efficient at binding folate. Um, it's, uh, um, and it's beneficial to the because uh, for, for the body to have backup systems. And so we're lucky that the body has a backup system. And that backup system is called the reduced folate carrier. So it ends up that if this one isn't working, um, there's a certain way we can use the reduced folate carrier to get folate into the brain. But you have to use high um, doses of folate. You need high levels of folate um, in the blood. And you have to use reduced folates. So most of, we, most of us are familiar with um, folic acid. And folic acid is the oxidized form of folate. If your body has to reduce it then 
to make it um, uh, usable in the body. Um, and, and oxidized folate is not going to go through the reduced folate carrier. So we can actually um, uh, treat this disorder with a special type of reduced folate. So um, in the original paper in 2005 in the New, Journal, in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, Rainmakers and Quatros um, uh, described this um, disorder, this classic cerebral folate um, deficiency, and it was really a neurodegenerative disorder where you'd actually have a decrease in head growth just before a year of age, and then you'd have this neurodevelopmental standstill and abrupt regression um, with, uh, with very um, <clears throat> obvious neurologic signs and a movement disorder, sometimes dyskinesis, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, pyramidal tract signs, so things like spasticity, seizures, and epilepsy. And if it wasn't treated, you could have visual disturbances, loss of vision, and hearing loss. In 2012, um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rosignol, and I um, said, wow, um, some of these kids, we looked back at these uh, papers, and we said, well, some of the kids they're describing that have the disorder seem to have autistic features. I wonder about kids with autism. Do just your run-of-the-mill kid with autism have these antibodies also? Because um, this terrible neurodegenerative disorder can be treated with a special type of folate. And so what we did is we found um, that um, overall in 93 um, children that we looked at, that <clears throat> 60% um, of them were positive for the blocking antibody in either low, medium, or high concentrations, and about 50% of them were positive for the binding antibody. So overall, 75% of them were positive for one of the two antibodies. What we then did is the children that were positive for the antibodies, we offered them the treatment, which is high-dose folinic acid at two milligrams per kilogram. Um, and it was in an open-label fashion. This is an open-label study. And then and in approximately four weeks, um, we asked them, uh, we asked the parents, was there any improvement or worsening in uh, certain aspects of their development, including receptive language, expressive language, verbal communication, nonverbal communication, stereotype behavior, hyperactivity, mood, attention, and, and aggression. And then um, we compared those to a wait list control. So those are children that actually had the antibodies measured, um, but um, did not have any treatment and didn't change any treatment during that time period between when they had it measured and the follow-up. And what we found is that there were significant improvements in receptive, expressive language, verbal communication, stereotype behavior, um, and attention. And recently, we've completed a double-blind placebo-controlled study where we show that language uh, significantly improves with um, high-dose folinic acid in children with autism, especially the ones with this autoantibody. So one of the other areas that's, uh, I think, very important and um, is a growing area of interest um, in neurodevelopmental disorders um, is, uh, and especially with relation to immune dysfunction, is this um, disorder called pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with uh, streptococcal infection. Or uh, more recently, I think it's been included in the uh, pediatric acute onset and neuropsychiatric system, or PANS, so PANDAS and PANS. And so this is, a, a, I think it's an interesting study about how um, the antibodies for this were actually um, uh, discovered, and of course, Dr. Cunningham here was the one that uh, discovered it in a very elegant manner in the studies that were done. Dr. Cunningham looked at uh, children with uh, um, Sydenham's chorea, and Sydenham's chorea, um, of course, is a, um, occurs as a result sometimes of a strep infection and is thought to be antibody-mediated. Um, and um, she um, uh, found uh, that uh, these chorea patients actually had these three monoclonal antibodies, and they reacted to um, this uh, one specific uh, um, dominant uh, epitope um, on uh, streptococcal A bacteria. So she identified the um, first 
what, uh, what that, um, that portion of, uh, of the bacteria it was uh, reacting to. And then it was suspected that these antibodies were binding to neurons, causing this neurologic abnormality, um, um, selected certain types of agents on the cell surface of the uh, of, uh, neurons, um, and um, found whether um, they actually inhibited um, the binding between the antibody and this part uh, of the bacteria, the N-acetyl-beta-D-glycosamine. Um, 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 and um, discovered that the lysogangliocyte GM1 um, uh, portion um, of the neuron um, was uh, very important and would be inhibit um, this uh, binding and suspected that um, that, that was a um, portion of the neuron that was being bind bound to. With that knowledge, also used inhibiting assays to show that the serum from those that had acute Sinahams chorea also could inhibit that binding, whereas the convalescence um, serum where they were, uh, they didn't have the movements anymore, did not actually have um, that, uh, that inhibition of binding, suggesting that it was that, uh, that, uh, that exact portion of the, the neuron it was binding to. Um, then to take it one step further, um, she asked, well, okay, the antibody binds, um, we found what the, the antibody binds to on the neuron, what is actually happening in the neuron that's, or a nerve cell to change thing? And she looked at CAM kinase 2, which is an extremely important enzyme um, in, uh, uh, in neuronal function. Um, it's important for, um, uh, for actually uh, production. Um, uh, well, it controls many different enzymes, but it, it's also important for the production of dopamine as well as um, other systems. Then she was actually able to measure um, whether the uh, serum of individuals with Sydenham's chorea, acute Sydenham's chorea, increased the activation of this enzyme in the cell. So showing that something in the serum actually activated the CAM kinase uh, 2, whereas this did not happen in the convalescent serum um, and did not help happen in um, the other controls. And then with other patients, she showed uh, the same thing, those that had acute Sydenham's chorea versus convalescent, um, that, uh, that only the acute samples actually increased CAM kinase 2, um, and then looked at uh, CSF because if the antibody um, was, um, uh, was activating something in the brain, of course, it would cross over and it would probably be in the CSF, so she actually took CSF and showed the exact same thing. In a separate paper, um, uh, I think it was suspected that um, these antibodies were binding to important parts of the brain, such as the caudate and pertainment in the basal ganglia. Um, and in uh, this paper, she used not only serum now from Sydenham's chorea patients, but she also took patients that had PANDAS, which uh, is a disorder where you also have um, repetitive movements, not as severe as Sydenham's chorea. Um, but um, also is thought to be um, uh, triggered by, um, uh, by an immune um, uh, stimulant um, or strep infection, just like Sydenham's chorea. So uh, she found that uh, CSF um, from PANDAS, uh, from two PANDAS patients, actually bound to um, the uh, caudate and pertainment, um, and so did the samples from Sydenham's chorea whereas control samples did not, suggesting that the binding was uh, happening at, in the basal ganglia where you would expect it to bind since that's important for uh, movement disorders. Um, then uh, she also showed, she measured this CAM kinase assay. Uh, she took serum from um, individuals with Sydenham's chorea, PANDAS and non-PANDAS patients and showed that uh, the PANDAS patients actually had an activation their serum had something in it um, that activated CAM kinase, whereas non-PANDAS patients did not, and the Sydenham's chorea patients also had activation. Um, she also looked at patients um, that had OCD, tics, ADHD, as other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, but did not have 
the pandas phenotype and showed <coughs> that it was only the pandas um, uh, patients that had this elevation in CAM kinase activity. Um, one of uh, recent studies um, um, was interesting to actually look um, in more detail at a clinical sample of patients with um, uh, ticks and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, in this sample, they looked at a large number of individuals, 742, um, and um, then treated them, uh, I'm sorry, then tested them for strep um, to see if they were strep uh, positive or strep negative, and also divided them into groups of individuals with ticks only, OCD only, or ticks and OCD. Um, and what they found was interesting. Um, the individuals that had both OCD and ticks were more likely to be strep positive, um, suggesting that strep was involved in, um, in triggering their disorder. Um, they looked at CAM kinase and uh, showed that the ones with ticks and OCD had slightly higher CAM kinase than those with just ticks or OCD. They, they compared the sample of um, those with OCD or ticks to controls and showed that CAM kinase was elevated and then also looked at the anti-lysogangliocide um, uh, um, antibody and showed that those were also elevated um, in individuals with OCD or ticks. And since, uh, you know, uh, previous studies had linked really um, Sydenham's chorea to this, uh, to this target, uh, it suggests that the same process that we've seen, Sydenham's chorea being um, uh, triggered by strep is similar um, in this group of um, individuals with OCD and ticks. So other studies um, um, haven't been as elegant, I should say, and they haven't used these specific antibodies. And I think it tells us something about um, why we should be using more specific antibodies. Here's a study from um, NIH, uh, Sue Suido, um, where she's looked at three different centers, NIMH, um, uh, the Chicago area and Bethesda area of individuals that have a pandas phenotype, uh, which is defined as prepubescent symptom onset, <coughs> presence of OCD or tick disorder, this acute symptom onset um, with a relapsing and remaining course, uh, association with neurologic abnormalities, and a temporal association between uh, a group A strep infection and symptom exacerbations. And what I find um, interesting about uh, this table is that if you, um, uh, that in order to define PANDAS, you're supposed to meet all five criteria. But if you actually look down at number five, the top line here, you'll see that in Hillsdale and Bethesda, not all of the patients um, had evidence of a strep infection. Um, so uh, um, so it, it suggests that even in this very well done study, that this idea of PANDAS isn't as pure as uh, we would really like it to be. And I think one of the points of this paper was really interesting it was to show some of the comorbid symptomatology that we see in PANDAS. And I think the more uh, and more patients that are being seen, the more we'll see how this phenotype is just more than ticks and OCD. And here you can see the comorbid symptomatology includes anxiety, emotional lability and depression, irritability, behavioral regression, deterioration in school performance, uh, sensory motor abnormalities, and somatic signs, which, is, which actually is something that um, uh, I think more people should be aware of because unless you ask about it, a lot of people don't volunteer uh, this information. But we see sleep disturbances, enuresis, and urinary frequency. And I've seen many patients um, that seem to have this abrupt change in their behavior. And then I ask them about some of these symptoms. And they say, oh, yeah, my, uh, my child's going to the bathroom all the time in school. For some reason, they're running to the bathroom. They keep asking the teacher to the bathroom all um, over and over again. Um, and it, it kind of rings a bell and makes you think, wow, maybe they do actually fall into this uh, category. Um, there's um, other symptoms that we don't always pair with a pandas that are interesting, including separation anxiety, of course, OCD um, uh, uh, symptoms, but not always classic OCD um, symptoms. Sometimes it's phobia and contamination fears. 
Um, and this is another theme that seems to be coming up. Um, many times there'll actually be a decrease in actually um, food intake because the, uh, the children will think that their food is contaminated um, uh, for some reason and actually you'll see um, weight loss. So restricted food intake down here seems to be a symptom that's coming up again and again. Um, in school there can be these new symptoms um, of inability to concentrate and you can think of it as almost uh, uh, a new onset um, ADHD type symptoms but it's not ADHD it seems to be more part of the pandas phenotype again urinary symptoms urinary frequency and urgency um, uh, dysgraphia and I think this study was very interesting this is another recent study um, where they try to then move on from the PANDAS uh, phenotype and talk about PANS, pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric <coughs> symptom, symptoms. Um, and I think what's interesting about this study is it starts to, uh, we start to actually look at the multiple infectious triggers, um, including not only group A strep, but mycoplasma, upper respiratory infections, Lyme. And here, this is a nice graph because uh, this shows the overlap of a, a group A strep infection, elevated ASLO titer, elevated anti-DNAs B, and we can see that these things don't always go together, so they can be very nonspecific. Um, and it kind of talks about the fact that, you know, these um, antibodies and signs are nonspecific and, and why we need more of a um, uh, specific marker for PANS or, or PANDAS. Uh, this study was also really interesting because what they did is they actually try to cluster some of the symptoms together. And they, uh, they found that many of these symptoms seem to um, cluster together a little bit. Um, um, uh, and um, what interests me here, you can see that, um, that this group of symptoms on the top, in the top cluster, you see elevated anti-DMASB is associated with simple tics and the urinary symptoms. Whereas on the bottom, you can see the cluster. You have more of the food restriction, fatigue, gastrointestinal, and elevated mycoplasma titers and complex ticks. So it suggests that there may be a common theme as far as having an immune trigger causing these antibodies, that, but there may be subtle differences in what the immune trigger is and which antibodies uh, may be um, uh, modulating the behaviors. Um, and this is a, a nice um, figure from um, Dr. Cunningham's paper that summarizes some of these processes, these antibodies that cross-react with um, infectious agents, target the basal ganglia. Um, in the neuron, they can activate CAM kinase, which will activate tyrosine hydrolase, and um, it, um, produce dopamine and increase uh, dopamine um, within the brain and cause uh, some of these um, um, abnormalities, both OCD behavior and tics. So how can we treat this? Um, so um, there's uh, many people treating uh, PANS and PANDAS all over, but unfortunately there's only a handful of studies that really, uh, controlled studies that uh, tell us about treatment. Um, this is probably one of the most classic studies. This was published in The Lancet in 1999. Um, this is a randomized uh, study where um, individuals, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders and tics, um, were randomized to either have placebo, um, IVIG, or plasma exchange. Um, and then um, after uh, treatment, the ones in the placebo um, uh, were able to get treatment afterwards. And from this study, it was pretty clear that the IVIG, if we look at different symptoms of obsessive compulsive symptoms, tics, um, uh, some of the sums, the, the psychological functioning, anxiety and such, that if we look um, at uh, the percent that changed and got better, that uh, it's much larger um, in the IVIG group and the plasma exchange group as compared to the placebo group. Um, and they have a nice graph that <coughs> really shows that this is the, um, they've, they've summed a lot of these scales to one number. And what we can see um, here is that um, at baseline um, for the IVIG, we can see the line where um, the uh, scale was very high, 
but after one month and one year, you can see um, this line go down, suggesting that the uh, symptoms improve significantly. For the placebo group, we can see that it didn't move at all. For the plasma exchange, we can see a drop down at one month and one year considerably, um, suggesting that these treatments um, were helpful. Um, <clears throat> since then, there's been a number of reports. This was um, a study by uh, Sue Sweeto where uh, they reported um, 12 youths with tics or OCD uh, symptoms who received IVIG and benefited from it. Um, it was really a case series. Um, most of the uh, patients that they selected for IVIG had other treatments, including antibiotics and psychotropic medications, and they did not benefit from those. Uh, many of the patients, they actually gave a burst of steroids first um, prior to giving IVIG to see if it would be helpful. Um, all of them benefited from IVIG to some extent. Most of it was given as a single dose and was repeated with exacerbations. Most of the time they gave steroids with the IVIG, so it's a little hard to pull out whether it's the steroids or the IVIG. And most of them were, were maintained on antibiotics um, after the IVIG. Um, to prevent their symptoms. Um, this was a, another study that was recently um, published um, by uh, Dr. Sweeto and Latimer, um, where they, uh, it was a, a, a case series for over many years where they looked at 35 severely ill children um, with, um, uh, with PANDAS who got uh, plasma phoresis, um, and they showed that, uh, that six months post plasma phoresis, they did uh, their um, uh, symptoms improve dramatically, uh, which are listed here. And interestingly, what they showed was that the time between the onset of symptoms and plasma phoresis seemed to predict um, their improvement. So the sooner the treatment was given, the better the improvement um, of the child. So in, in summary, uh, this is a growing area of interest of immune um, abnormalities and neurodevelopmental disorders. Children with autism are more likely to have a family history of autoimmune disorders, although a link to a specific um, HLA haplotype is really uncertain. There's studies that suggest that there's increases in inflammatory cytokines, especially those to linked to innate immunity in the brains of children with autism. There's been multiple autoantibodies associated with autism. Um, and uh, not all of them ha do we know um, if they're important or not or what their mechanism may be in disrupting brain development. There's really exciting research, especially maternal autoantibodies that suggest antibodies in pregnant women may be disrupting brain development in um, some subset of children with autism. Um, there's the folate autoantibody, which we find in children with autism that, that may disrupt folate transport into the nervous system. And we know that we have a treatment for that. High-dose folinic acid is very useful, uh, especially for improving language. Um, so PANS and PANDAS um, appear to be associated with autoimmune processes. Um, there seems to be um, an association with the anti-lysoganglia CYGM1, which, is, which targets the basal ganglia and increases CAM kinase 2. And CAM kinase um, is believed to increase dopamine out output leading to symptoms. Um, PANS um, uh, is a, a, a disorder that seems to be more described recently uh, that has multiple infectious triggers probably. Um, and, uh, and both PANS and PANDAS seem to have a wide variety of symptoms besides OCD and tics that are important to look for, including anxiety, emotional ability, depression, irritability, behavioral regression, deterioration in school performance, sleep disturbance, urinary frequency, and restricted food intake. Treatments um, uh, for PANS and PANDAS, there hasn't been a lot of good um, controlled trials um, for the treatments. The ones that have really been reported are IVIG um, and uh, plasma exchange. Um, but you know, there's the caveat that these um, really trials are small numbers of patients and are usually used after more conservative treatments um, have failed. There are more conservative treatments uh, such as short and chronic courses of antibiotics, steroids, anti-inflammatory um, <coughs> drugs. 
However, there's not any controlled studies and there's really very few case studies um, on the use of these treatments. So um, to treat um, these disorders, if you suspect them, I would encourage you to do it in coordination with an experienced clinician um, since there are no real guidelines for treatment and there aren't any studies. And I believe this is a highly important area of growing research and it may lead us um, to, um, to therapeutic um, uh, treatments for our children with neurodevelopmental disorders.